Chapter Thirty One of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter Thirty One Where the Brook and River Meet. Anne had her good summer and enjoyed it wholeheartedly. She and Diana fairly lived outdoors reveling in all the delights that Lover's Lane and the Dryad's Bubble and Willowmere and Victoria Island afforded. Marilla offered no objections to Anne's gypsyings. The Spencervale doctor who had come the night Minnie May had the croup met Anne at the house of a patient one afternoon early in vacation, looked her over sharply, screwed up his mouth, shook his head, and sent a message to Marilla Cuthbert by another person. It was— Keep that red-headed girl of yours in the open air all summer, and don't let her read books until she gets more spring into her step." This message frightened Marilla wholesomely. She read Anne's death warrant by consumption in it, unless it was scrupulously obeyed. As a result, Anne had the golden summer of her life as far as freedom and frolic went. She walked, rode, buried, and dreamed to her heart's content, and when September came she was bright-eyed and alert with a step that would have satisfied the Spencervale doctor, and a heart full of ambition and zest once more. "'I feel just like studying with might and main,' she declared as she brought her books down from the attic. "'Oh, you good old friends! I'm glad to see your honest faces once more. Yes, even you, Geometry. I've had a perfectly beautiful summer, Marilla, and now I'm rejoicing as a strong man to run a race, as Mr. Allen said last Sunday. Doesn't Mr. Allen preach magnificent sermons?' Mrs. Lynde says he is improving every day, and the first thing we know some city church will gobble him up, and then we'll be left and have to turn to and break in another green preacher. But I don't see the use of meeting trouble halfway, do you, Marilla? I think it would be better just to enjoy Mr. Allen while we have him. If I were a man I think I'd be a minister. They can have such an influence for good if their theology is sound, and it must be thrilling to preach splendid sermons and stir your hearers' hearts. Why can't women be ministers, Marilla? I asked Mrs. Lynde that, and she was shocked, and said it would be a scandalous thing. She said there might be female ministers in the States, and she believed there was, but thank goodness we hadn't got to that stage in Canada yet, and she hoped we never would. But I don't see why. I think women would make splendid ministers. When there is a social to be got up, or a church tea, or anything else to raise money, the women have to turn to and do the work. I'm sure Mrs. Lynde can pray every bit as well as Superintendent Bell, and I've no doubt she could preach too with a little practice." "'Yes, I believe she could,' said Marilla dryly. "'She does plenty of unofficial preaching as it is. Nobody has much of a chance to go wrong in Avonlea with Rachel to oversee them." "'Marilla,' said Anne in a burst of confidence, "'I want to tell you something and ask you what you think about it. It has worried me terribly. On Sunday afternoons, that is, when I think specially about such matters. I do really want to be good, and when I'm with you or Mrs. Allen or Miss Stacy I want it more than ever, and I want to do just what would please you and what you would approve of. But mostly when I'm with Mrs. Lynde I feel desperately wicked, and as if I wanted to go and do the very thing she tells me I oughtn't to do. I feel irresistibly tempted to do it. Now what do you think is the reason I feel like that? Do you think it's because I'm really bad and unregenerate?" Marilla looked dubious for a moment. Then she laughed. "'If you are, I guess I am too, Anne, for Rachel often has that very effect on me. I sometimes think she'd have more of an influence for good, as you say yourself, if she didn't keep nagging people to do right. There should have been a special commandment against nagging. But there, I shouldn't talk so. Rachel is a good Christian woman and she means well. There isn't a kinder soul in Avonlea, and she never shirks her share of work." "'I'm very glad you feel the same,' said Anne decidedly. "'It's so encouraging. I shan't worry so much over that after this. But I dare say there'll be other things to worry me. They keep coming up new all the time. Things to perplex you, you know. You settle one question and there's another right after. There are so many things to be thought over and decided when you're beginning to grow up. It keeps me busy all the time thinking them over and deciding what is right. It's a serious thing to grow up, isn't it, Marilla? But when I have such good friends as you and Matthew and Mrs. Allen and Miss Stacy, I ought to grow up successfully, and I'm sure it will be my own fault if I don't. I feel it's a great responsibility because I have only the one chance. If I don't grow up right I can't go back and begin over again. 
I've grown two inches this summer, Marilla. Mr. Gillis measured me at Ruby's party. I'm so glad you made my new dresses longer. That dark green one is so pretty, and it was sweet of you to put on the flounce. Of course I know it wasn't really necessary, but flounces are so stylish this fall, and Josie Pye has flounces on all her dresses. I know I'll be able to study better because of mine. I shall have such a comfortable feeling deep down in my mind about that flounce. It's worth something to have that," admitted Marilla. Miss Stacy came back to Avonlea School and found all her pupils eager for work once more. Especially did the Queen's class gird up their loins for the fray, for at the end of the coming year, dimly shadowing their pathway already, loomed up that fateful thing known as the entrance, at the thought of which one and all felt their hearts sink into their very shoes. Suppose they did not pass. That thought was doomed to haunt Anne through the waking hours of that winter, Sunday afternoons inclusive, to the almost entire exclusion of moral and theological problems. When Anne had bad dreams, she found herself staring miserably at pass lists of the entrance exams, where Gilbert Blythe's name was blazoned at the top and in which hers did not appear at all. But it was a jolly, busy, happy, swift-flying winter. School work was as interesting, class rivalry as absorbing, as of yore. New worlds of thought, feeling, and ambition, fresh, fascinating fields of unexplored knowledge seemed to be opening out before Anne's eager eyes. Hills peeped o'er hill and Alps on Alps arose. Much of all this was due to Miss Stacy's tactful, careful, broad-minded guidance. She led her class to think and explore and discover for themselves, and encouraged straying from the old beaten paths to a degree that quite shocked Mrs. Lynde and the school trustees, who viewed all innovations on established methods rather dubiously. Apart from her studies, Anne expanded socially, for Marilla, mindful of the Spencervale doctor's dictum, no longer vetoed occasional outings. The debating club flourished and gave several concerts. There were one or two parties almost verging on grown-up affairs. There were sleigh drives and skating frolics galore. Between times Anne grew, shooting up so rapidly that Marilla was astonished one day, when they were standing side by side, to find the girl was taller than herself. "'Why, Anne, how you've grown!' she said almost unbelievingly. A sigh followed on the words. Marilla felt a queer regret over Anne's inches. The child she had learned to love had vanished somehow, and here was this tall, serious-eyed girl of fifteen, with the thoughtful brows and the proudly poised little head, in her place. Marilla loved the girl as much as she had loved the child, but she was conscious of a queer, sorrowful sense of loss. And that night, when Anne had gone to prayer meeting with Diana, Marilla sat alone in the wintry twilight and indulged in the weakness of a cry. Matthew, coming in with a lantern, caught her at it and gazed at her in such consternation that Marilla had to laugh through her tears. "'I was thinking about Anne,' she explained. "'She's got to be such a big girl, and she'll probably be away from us next winter. I'll miss her terrible.' "'She'll be able to come home often,' comforted Matthew, to whom Anne was as yet and always would be the little eager girl he had brought home from Bright River on that June evening four years before. "'The branch railroad will be built to Carmody by that time.' "'It won't be the same thing as having her here all the time,' sighed Marilla gloomily, determined to enjoy her luxury of grief uncomforted. "'But there, men can't understand these things.' There were other changes in Anne no less real than the physical change. For one thing, she became much quieter. Perhaps she thought all the more and dreamed as much as ever, but she certainly talked less. Marilla noticed and commented on this also. You don't chatter half as much as you used to, Anne, nor use half as many big words. What has come over you? Anne colored and laughed a little, as she dropped her book and looked dreamily out of the window where big, fat red buds were bursting out on the creeper in response to the lure of the spring sunshine. "'I don't know. I don't want to talk as much,' she said, denting her chin thoughtfully with her forefinger. "'It's nicer to think dear, pretty thoughts and keep them in one's heart, like treasures. I don't like to have them laughed at or wondered over. And somehow I don't want to use big words any more. It's almost a pity, isn't it, now that I'm really growing big enough to say them if I did want to. It's fun to be almost grown up in some ways, but it's not the kind of fun I expected, Marilla. There's so much to learn and do and think that there isn't time for big words. Besides, Miss Stacy says the short ones are much stronger and better. 
She makes us write all our essays as simply as possible. It was hard at first. I was so used to crowding in all the fine big words I could think of, and I thought of any number of them. But I've got used to it now, and I see it so much better. What has become of your story club? I haven't heard you speak of it for a long time. The story club isn't in existence any longer. We hadn't time for it, and anyhow I think we had got tired of it. It was silly to be writing about love and murder and elopements and mysteries. Miss Stacy sometimes has us write a story for training in composition, but she won't let us write anything but what might happen in Avonlea in our own lives, and she criticizes it very sharply and makes us criticize our own, too. I never thought my compositions had so many faults until I began to look for them myself. I felt so ashamed I wanted to give up altogether, but Miss Stacy said I could learn to write well if I only trained myself to be my own severest critic, and so I am trying to. You've only two more months before the entrance, said Marilla. Do you think you'll be able to get through? Anne shivered. I don't know. Sometimes I think I'll be all right, and then I get horribly afraid. We've studied hard and Miss Stacy has drilled us thoroughly, but we mayn't get through for all that. We've each got a stumbling block. Mine is geometry, of course, and Jane's is Latin, and Ruby and Charlie's is algebra, and Josie's is arithmetic. Moody Spurgeon says he feels it in his bones that he is going to fail in English history. Miss Stacy is going to give us examinations in June just as hard as we'll have at the entrance and mark us just as strictly, so we'll have some idea. I wish it was all over, Marilla. It haunts me. Sometimes I wake up in the night and wonder what I'll do if I don't pass. Why go to school next year and try again? said Marilla unconcernedly. Oh, I don't believe I'd have the heart for it. It would be such a disgrace to fail, especially if guilt, if the others passed. And I get so nervous in an examination that I'm likely to make a mess of it. I wish I had nerves like Jane Andrews. Nothing rattles her. Anne sighed, and, dragging her eyes from the witcheries of the spring world, the beckoning day of breeze and blue, and the green things upspringing in the garden, buried herself resolutely in her book. There would be other springs, but if she did not succeed in passing the entrance, Anne felt convinced that she would never recover sufficiently to enjoy them. End of chapter 31Chapter 32 of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 32 The Pass List is Out. With the end of June came the close of the term, and the close of Miss Stacy's rule in Avonlea School. Anne and Diana walked home that evening feeling very sober indeed. Red eyes and damp handkerchiefs bore convincing testimony to the fact that Miss Stacy's farewell words must have been quite as touching as Mr. Phillips's had been under similar circumstances three years before. Diana looked back at the schoolhouse from the foot of the spruce hill and sighed deeply. It does seem as if it was the end of everything, doesn't it? She said dismally. You oughtn't to feel half as badly as I do, said Anne, hunting vainly for a dry spot on her handkerchief. You'll be back again next winter, but I suppose I've left the dear old school forever, if I have good luck, that is. It won't be a bit the same. Miss Stacy won't be there, nor you, nor Jane, nor Ruby, probably. I shall have to sit all alone, for I couldn't bear to have another deskmate after you. Oh, we have had jolly times, haven't we, Anne? It's dreadful to think they're all over. Two big tears rolled down by Diana's nose. If you would stop crying, I could, said Anne imploringly. Just as soon as I put away my hanky, I see you brimming up, and that starts me off again. As Mrs. Lynde says, if you can't be cheerful, be as cheerful as you can. After all, I dare say I'll be back next year. This is one of the times I know I'm not going to pass. They're getting alarmingly frequent. Why? You came out splendidly in the exams Miss Stacy gave. Yes, but those exams didn't make me nervous. When I think of the real thing, you can't imagine what a horrid, cold, fluttery feeling comes round my heart. And then my number is thirteen, and Josie Pye says it's so unlucky. I am not superstitious, and I know it can make no difference. But still I wish it wasn't thirteen. I do wish I was going in with you, said Diana. Wouldn't we have a perfectly elegant time? but I suppose you will have to cram in the evenings. 
No, Miss Stacy has made us promise not to open a book at all. She says it would only tire and confuse us, and we are to go out walking and not think about the exams at all and go to bed early. It's good advice, but I expect it will be hard to follow. Good advice is apt to be, I think. Prissy Andrews told me that she sat up half the night every night of her entrance week and crammed for dear life, and I had determined to sit up at least as long as she did. It was so kind of your Aunt Josephine to ask me to stay at Beechwood while I'm in town. You will write to me while you're in, won't you? I'll write Tuesday night and tell you how the first day goes, promised Anne. I'll be haunting the post office Wednesday, vowed Diana. Anne went to town the following Monday, and on Wednesday Diana haunted the post office, as agreed, and got her letter. Dearest Diana, wrote Anne, here it is Tuesday night and I'm writing this in the library at Beechwood. Last night I was horribly lonesome all alone in my room and wished so much you were with me. I couldn't cram because I'd promised Miss Stacy not to, but it was as hard to keep from opening my history as it used to be to keep from reading a story before my lessons were learned. This morning Miss Stacy came for me and we went to the academy, calling for Jane and Ruby and Josie on our way. Ruby asked me to feel her hands and they were as cold as ice. Josie said I looked as if I hadn't slept a wink, and she didn't believe I was strong enough to stand the grind of the teacher's course even if I did get through. There are times and seasons even yet when I don't feel that I've made any great headway in learning to like Josie Pye. When we reached the academy, there were scores of students there from all over the island. The first person we saw was Moody Spurgeon sitting on the steps and muttering away to himself. Jane asked him what on earth he was doing, and he said he was repeating the multiplication table over and over to steady his nerves, and for pity's sake not to interrupt him, because if he stopped for a moment he got frightened and forgot everything he ever knew but the multiplication table kept all his facts firmly in their proper place. When we were assigned to our rooms, Miss Stacy had to leave us. Jane and I sat together, and Jane was so composed that I envied her. No need of the multiplication table for good, steady, sensible Jane. I wondered if I looked as I felt and if they could hear my heart thumping clear across the room. Then a man came in and began distributing the English examination sheets. My hands grew cold then, and my head fairly whirled around as I picked it up. Just one awful moment. Diana, I felt exactly as I did four years ago when I asked Marilla if I might stay at Green Gables. And then everything cleared up in my mind and my heart began beating again. I forgot to say that it had stopped altogether, for I knew I could do something with that paper anyhow. At noon we went home for dinner, and then back again for history in the afternoon. The history was a pretty hard paper and I got dreadfully mixed up in the dates. Still, I think I did fairly well today. But, oh, Diana, tomorrow the geometry exam comes off, and when I think of it, it takes every bit of determination I possess to keep from opening my Euclid. If I thought the multiplication table would help me any, I would recite it from now till tomorrow morning. I went down to see the other girls this evening. On my way I met Moody Spurgeon wandering distractedly around. He said he knew that he had failed in history and he was born to be a disappointment to his parents and he was going home on the morning train, and it would be easier to be a carpenter than a minister anyhow. I cheered him up and persuaded him to stay to the end because it would be unfair to Miss Stacy if he didn't. Sometimes I have wished I was born a boy, but when I see Moody Spurgeon I'm always glad I'm a girl and not his sister. Ruby was in hysterics when I reached their boarding house. She had just discovered a fearful mistake she had made in her English paper. When she recovered we went uptown and had an ice cream. How we wished you had been with us! Oh, Diana, if only the geometry examination were over. But there, as Mrs. Lynde would say, the sun will go on rising and setting whether I fail in geometry or not. That is true, but not especially comforting. I think I'd rather it didn't go on if I failed. Yours devotedly, Anne. The geometry examination and all the others were over in due time, and Anne arrived home on Friday evening, rather tired, but with an air of chastened triumph about her. Diana was over at Green Gables when she arrived, and they met as if they had been parted for years. "'You old darling! It's perfectly splendid to see you back again. It seems like an age since you went to town, and oh, Anne, how did you get along?' "'Pretty well, I think, in everything but the geometry. I don't know whether I passed in it or not, and I have a creepy, crawly presentiment that I didn't. Oh, how good it is to be back! Green Gables is the dearest, loveliest spot in the world. How did the others do? The girls say they know they didn't pass, but I think they did pretty well. Josie says the geometry was so easy a child of ten could do it. 
Moody Spurgeon still thinks he failed in history and Charlie says he failed in algebra. But we don't really know anything about it and won't until the pass list is out. That won't be for a fortnight. Fancy living a fortnight in such suspense. I wish I could go to sleep and never wake up until it is over. Diana knew it would be useless to ask how Gilbert Blythe had fared, so she merely said, Oh, you'll pass all right. Don't worry. I'd rather not pass at all than not come out pretty well up on the list, flashed Anne, by which she meant, and Diana knew she meant, that success would be incomplete and bitter if she did not come out ahead of Gilbert Blythe. With this end in view Anne had strained every nerve during the examinations. So had Gilbert. They had met and passed each other on the street a dozen times without any sign of recognition, and every time Anne had held her head a little higher and wished a little more earnestly that she had made friends with Gilbert when he asked her, and vowed a little more determinedly to surpass him in the examination. She knew that all Avonlea Jr. was wondering which would come out first. She even knew that Jimmy Glover and Ned Wright had a bet on the question, and that Josie Pye had said there was no doubt in the world that Gilbert would be first and she felt that her humiliation would be unbearable if she failed. But she had another and nobler motive for wishing to do well. She wanted to pass high for the sake of Matthew and Marilla, especially Matthew. Matthew had declared to her his conviction that she would beat the whole island. That, Anne felt, was something it would be foolish to hope for even in the wildest dreams. But she did hope fervently that she would be among the first ten at least, so that she might see Matthew's kindly brown eyes gleam with pride in her achievement. That, she felt, would be a sweet reward indeed for all her hard work and patient grubbing among unimaginative equations and conjugations. At the end of the fortnight Anne took to haunting the post office also, in the distracted company of Jane, Ruby, and Josie, opening the Charlottetown dailies with shaking hands and cold, sink-away feelings as bad as any experienced during the entrance week. Charlie and Gilbert were not above doing this, too, but Moody Spurgeon stayed resolutely away. I haven't got the grit to go there and look at a paper in cold blood, he told Anne. I'm just going to wait until somebody comes and tells me suddenly whether I passed or not. When three weeks had gone by without the pass list appearing, Anne began to feel that she really couldn't stand the strain much longer. Her appetite failed, and her interest in Avonlea doings languished. Mrs. Lynde wanted to know what else you could expect with the Tory superintendent of education at the head of the affairs, and Matthew, noting Anne's paleness and indifference, and the lagging steps that bore her home from the post office every afternoon, began seriously to wonder if he hadn't better vote grit at the next election. But one evening the news came. Anne was sitting at her open window, for the time forgetful of the woes of examinations and the cares of the world, as she drank in the beauty of the summer dusk, sweet-scented with flower breaths from the garden below, and sibilant and rustling from the stir of poplars. The eastern sky above the firs was flushed faintly pink from the reflection of the west, and Anne was wondering dreamily if the spirit of color looked like that, when she saw Diana come flying down through the firs, over the log bridge and up the slope, with a fluttering newspaper in her hand. Anne sprang to her feet, knowing at once what that paper contained. The pass list was out! Her head whirled and her heart beat until it hurt her. She could not move a step. It seemed an hour to her before Diana came rushing along the hall and burst into the room without even knocking, so great was her excitement. "'And you've passed!' she cried. "'Passed the very first! You and Gilbert both, your ties, but your name is first. Oh, I'm so proud!' Diana flung the paper on the table and herself on Anne's bed, utterly breathless and incapable of further speech. Anne lighted the lamp, oversetting the match safe and using up half a dozen matches before her shaking hands could accomplish the task. Then she snatched up the paper. Yes, she had passed. There was her name at the very top of a list of two hundred. That moment was worth living for. You did just splendidly, Anne, puffed Diana, recovering sufficiently to sit up and speak, for Anne, starry-eyed and rapt, had not uttered a word. Father brought the paper home from Bright River not ten minutes ago. It came out in the afternoon train, you know, and won't be here till tomorrow by mail. And when I saw the pass list, I just rushed over like a wild thing. You've all passed, every one of you, Moody Spurgeon and all, although he's conditioned in history. Jane and Ruby did pretty well. They're halfway up, and so did Charlie. Josie just scraped through with three marks to spare, but you'll see she'll put on as many airs as if she'd led. 
won't miss stacy be delighted oh anne what does it feel like to see your name at the head of a pass list like that if it were me i know i'd go crazy with joy i am pretty near crazy as it is but you're as calm and cool as a spring evening i'm just dazzled inside said anne i want to say a hundred things and i can't find words to say them in i never dreamed of this yes i did too just once i let myself think once what if i should come out first quakingly you know for it seemed so vain and presumptuous to think i could lead the island excuse me a minute diana i must run right out to the field to tell matthew then we'll go up the road and tell the good news to the others they hurried to the hayfield below the barn where matthew was coiling hay and as luck would have it mrs lynde was talking to marilla at the lane fence oh matthew exclaimed anne i've passed and i'm first or one of the first i'm not vain but i'm thankful well now i always said it said matthew gazing at the pass list delightedly i knew you could beat them all easy you've done pretty well i must say anne said marilla trying to hide her extreme pride in anne from mrs rachel's critical eye but that good soul said heartily i guess she's done well and far be it for me to be backward in saying it you're a credit to your friends anne that's what and we're all proud of you that night anne who had wound up the delightful evening with a serious little talk with mrs allan at the manse knelt sweetly by her open window in a great sheen of moonshine and murmured a prayer of gratitude and aspiration that came straight from her heart there was in it thankfulness for the past and reverent petition for the future and when she slept on her white pillow her dreams were as fair and bright and beautiful as maidenhood might desire end of chapter 32《Chapter Thirty Three of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter Thirty Three The Hotel Concert. Put on your white organdy by all means, Anne, advised Diana decidedly. They were together in the east gable chamber. Outside it was only twilight, a lovely yellowish-green twilight with a clear blue cloudless sky. A big round moon, slowly deepening from her pallid luster into burnished silver, hung over the haunted wood. The air was full of sweet summer sounds, sleepy birds twittering, freakish breezes, far-away voices and laughter. But in Anne's room the blind was drawn and the lamp lighted, for an important toilet was being made. The east gable was a very different place from what it had been on that night four years before, when Anne had felt its bareness penetrate to the marrow of her spirit with its inhospitable chill. Changes had crept in, Marilla conniving at them resignedly, until it was as sweet and dainty a nest as a young girl could desire. The velvet carpet with the pink roses and the pink silk curtains of Anne's early visions had certainly never materialized, but her dreams had kept pace with her growth, and it is not probable she lamented them. The floor was covered with a pretty matting, and the curtains that softened the high window and fluttered in the vagrant breezes were of pale green art muslin. The walls, hung not with gold and silver brocade tapestry, but with a dainty apple-blossom paper, were adorned with a few good pictures given Anne by Mrs. Allen. Miss Stacy's photograph occupied the place of honor, and Anne made a sentimental point of keeping fresh flowers on the bracket under it. Tonight a spike of white lilies faintly perfumed the room like the dream of a fragrance. There was no mahogany furniture, but there was a white-painted bookcase filled with books, a cushioned wicker rocker, a toilet table befrilled with white muslin, a quaint, gilt-framed mirror with chubby pink cupids and purple grapes painted over its arched top that used to hang in the spare room, and a low white bed. Anne was dressing for a concert at the White Sands Hotel. The guests had got it up in aid of the Charlottetown Hospital, and had hunted out all the available amateur talent in the surrounding districts to help it along. Bertha Sampson and Pearl Clay of the White Sands Baptist Choir had been asked to sing a duet. Milton Clark of Newbridge was to give a violin solo. Winnie Adela Blair of Carmody was to sing a Scotch ballad. 
and Laura Spencer of Spencervale and Anne Shirley of Avonlea were to recite. As Anne would have said at one time, it was an epoch in her life, and she was deliciously a thrill with the excitement of it. Matthew was in the seventh heaven of gratified pride over the honor conferred on his Anne, and Marilla was not far behind, although she would have died rather than admit it, and said she didn't think it was very proper for a lot of young folks to be gadding over to the hotel without any responsible person with them. Anne and Diana were to drive over with Jane Andrews and her brother Billy in their double-seated buggy, and several other Avonlea girls and boys were going too. There was a party of visitors expected out from town, and after the concert a supper was to be given to the performers. "'Do you really think the organdy will be best?' queried Anne anxiously. "'I don't think it's as pretty as my blue-flowered muslin, and it certainly isn't so fashionable.' "'But it suits you ever so much better,' said Diana. "'It's so soft and frilly and clinging. The muslin is stiff and makes you look too dressed up. But the organdy seems as if it grew on you.' Anne sighed and yielded. Diana was beginning to have a reputation for notable taste in dressing, and her advice on such subjects was much sought after. She was looking very pretty herself on this particular night, in a dress of the lovely wild rose pink, from which Anne was forever debarred, but she was not to take any part in the concert, so her appearance was of minor importance. All her pains were bestowed upon Anne, who, she vowed, must, for the credit of Avonlea, be dressed and combed and adorned to the queen's taste. Pull out that frill a little more. So, here, let me tie your sash. Now, for your slippers. I'm going to braid your hair into two thick braids and tie them halfway up with big white bows. No, don't pull out a single curl over your forehead. Just have the soft part. There's no way you do your hair suits you so well, Anne. And Mrs. Allen says you look like a Madonna when you part it so. I shall fasten this little white house rose just behind your ear. There was just one on my bush, and I saved it for you. Shall I put my pearl beads on? asked Anne. Matthew brought me a string from town last week, and I know he'd like to see them on me. Diana pursed up her lips, put her black head on one side critically, and finally pronounced in favor of the beads, which were thereupon tied around Anne's slim, milk-white throat. "'There's something so stylish about you, Anne,' said Diana, with unenvious admiration. "'You hold your head with such an air. I suppose it's your figure. I'm just a dumpling. I've always been afraid of it, and now I know it is so. Well, I suppose I'll just have to resign myself to it.' "'But you have such dimples,' said Anne, smiling affectionately into the pretty, vivacious face so near her own. "'Lovely dimples, like little dents in cream. I have given up all hope of dimples. My dimple dream will never come true, but so many of my dreams have that I mustn't complain. Am I all ready now?' "'All ready,' assured Diana, as Marilla appeared in the doorway, a gaunt figure with grayer hair than of yore and no fewer angles, but with a much softer face. "'Come right in and look at our elocutionist, Marilla. Doesn't she look lovely?' Marilla emitted a sound between a sniff and a grunt. "'She looks neat and proper. I like that way of fixing her hair. But I expect she'll ruin that dress driving over there in the dust and dew with it, and it looks most too thin for these damp nights. Organdy's the most unserviceable stuff in the world, anyhow, and I told Matthew so when he got it. But there is no use in saying anything to Matthew nowadays. Time was when he would take my advice, but now he just buys things for Anne regardless and the clerks at Carmody know they can palm anything off on him. Just let them tell him a thing is pretty and fashionable, and Matthew plunks his money down for it. Mind you keep your skirt clear of the wheel, Anne, and put your warm jacket on." Then Marilla stalked downstairs, thinking proudly how sweet Anne looked, with that one moonbeam from the forehead to the crown, and regretting that she could not go to the concert herself to hear her girl recite. "'I wonder if it is too damp for my dress.' said Anne anxiously. "'Not a bit of it,' said Diana, pulling up the window-blind. "'It's a perfect night, and there won't be any dew. Look at the moonlight.' "'I'm so glad my window looks east into the sun rising,' said Anne, going over to Diana. "'It's so splendid to see the morning coming up over those long hills and glowing through those sharp fir-tops. 
It's new every morning, and I feel as if I washed my very soul in that bath of earliest sunshine. Oh, Diana, I love this little room so dearly. I don't know how I'll get along without it when I go to town next month. Don't speak of your going away tonight, begged Diana. I don't want to think of it. It makes me so miserable. And I do want to have a good time this evening. What are you going to recite, Anne? And are you nervous? Not a bit. I've recited so often in public I don't mind at all now. I've decided to give The Maiden's Vow. It's so pathetic. Laura Spencer is going to give a comic recitation, but I'd rather make people cry than laugh. What will you recite if they encore you? They won't dream of encoring me, scoffed Anne, who was not without her own secret hopes that they would, and already visioned herself telling Matthew all about it at the next morning's breakfast table. There are Billy and Jane now. I hear the wheels. Come on. Billy Andrews insisted that Anne should ride on the front seat with him, so she unwillingly climbed up. She would have much preferred to sit back with the girls, where she could have laughed and chattered to her heart's content. There was not much of either laughter or chatter in Billy. He was a big, fat, stolid youth of twenty, with a round, expressionless face, and a painful lack of conversational gifts. But he admired Anne immensely, and was puffed up with pride over the prospect of driving to White Sands with that slim, upright figure beside him. Anne, by dint of talking over her shoulder to the girls, and occasionally passing a sop of civility to Billy, who grinned and chuckled and never could think of any reply until it was too late, contrived to enjoy the drive in spite of all. It was a night for enjoyment. The road was full of buggies, all bound for the hotel, and laughter, silver clear, echoed and re-echoed along it. When they reached the hotel, it was a blaze of light from top to bottom. They were met by the ladies of the concert committee, one of whom took Anne off to the performer's dressing room, which was filled with the members of a Charlottetown symphony club, among whom Anne felt suddenly shy and frightened and countrified. Her dress, which, in the East Gable, had seemed so dainty and pretty, now seemed simple and plain. Too simple and plain, she thought, among all the silks and laces that glistened and rustled around her. What were her pearl beads compared to the diamonds of the big handsome lady near her? And how poor her one wee white rose must look beside all the hothouse flowers the others wore? Anne laid her hat and jacket away, and shrank miserably into a corner. She wished herself back in the white room at Green Gables. It was still worse on the platform of the big concert hall of the hotel, where she presently found herself. The electric lights dazzled her eyes, the perfume and hum bewildered her. She wished she were sitting down in the audience with Diana and Jane, who seemed to be having a splendid time away at the back. She was wedged in between a stout lady in pink silk and a tall, scornful-looking girl in a white lace dress. The stout lady occasionally turned her head squarely around and surveyed Anne through her eyeglasses until Anne, acutely sensitive of being so scrutinized, felt that she must scream aloud. And the white lace girl kept talking audibly to her next neighbor about the country bumpkins and rustic bells in the audience, languidly anticipating such fun from the displays of local talent on the program. Anne believed that she would hate that white lace girl to the end of life. Unfortunately for Anne, a professional elocutionist was staying at the hotel and had consented to recite. She was a lithe, dark-eyed woman, in a wonderful gown of shimmering gray stuff like woven moonbeams, with gems on her neck and in her dark hair. She had a marvelously flexible voice and wonderful power of expression. The audience went wild over her selection. Anne, forgetting all about herself and her troubles for the time, listened with rapt and shining eyes. But when the recitation ended she suddenly put her hands over her face. She could never get up and recite after that, never. Had she ever thought she could recite? Oh, if she were only back at Green Gables! At this unpropitious moment her name was called. Somehow Anne, who did not notice the rather guilty little start of surprise the white lace girl gave, and would not have understood the subtle compliment implied therein if she had, got on her feet and moved dizzily out to the front. She was so pale that Diana and Jane, down in the audience, clasped each other's hands in nervous sympathy. 
Anne was the victim of an overwhelming attack of stage fright. Often as she had recited in public, she had never before faced such an audience as this, and the sight of it paralyzed her energies completely. Everything was so strange, so brilliant, so bewildering. The rows of ladies in evening dress, the critical faces, the whole atmosphere of wealth and culture about her. Very different this from the plain benches at the debating club, filled with the homely, sympathetic faces of friends and neighbors. These people, she thought, would be merciless critics. Perhaps, like the white lace girl, they anticipated amusement from her rustic efforts. She felt hopelessly, helplessly ashamed and miserable. Her knees trembled, her heart fluttered, a horrible faintness came over her. Not a word could she utter, and the next moment she would have fled from the platform despite the humiliation which, she felt, must ever after be her portion if she did so. But suddenly, as her dilated, frightened eyes gazed out over the audience, she saw Gilbert Blythe away at the back of the room, bending forward with a smile on his face, a smile which seemed to Anne at once triumphant and taunting. In reality it was nothing of the kind. Gilbert was merely smiling with appreciation of the whole affair in general, and of the effect produced by Anne's slender white form and spiritual face against a background of palms in particular. Josie Pye, whom he had driven over, sat beside him, and her face certainly was both triumphant and taunting. But Anne did not see Josie, and would not have cared if she had. She drew a long breath and flung her head up proudly, courage and determination tingling over her like an electric shock. She would not fail before Gilbert Blythe. He should never be able to laugh at her, never, never. Her fright and nervousness vanished, and she began her recitation, her clear, sweet voice reaching to the farthest corner of the room without a tremor or a break. Self-possession was fully restored to her, and in the reaction from that horrible moment of powerlessness she recited as she had never done before. When she finished there were bursts of honest applause. Anne, stepping back to her seat, blushing with shyness and delight, found her hand vigorously clasped and shaken by the stout lady in pink silk. "'My dear, you did splendidly,' she puffed. "'I've been crying like a baby. Actually, I have. There, they're encoring you. They're bound to have you back.' "'Oh, I can't go,' said Anne confusedly. "'But yet, I must, or Matthew will be disappointed. He said they would encore me.' "'Then don't disappoint, Matthew,' said the pink lady, laughing. Smiling, blushing, limpid-eyed, Anne tripped back and gave a quaint, funny little selection that captivated her audience still further. The rest of the evening was quite a little triumph for her. When the concert was over, the stout pink lady, who was the wife of an American millionaire, took her under her wing and introduced her to everybody, and everybody was very nice to her. The professional elocutionist, Mrs. Evans, came and chatted with her, telling her that she had a charming voice and interpreted her selections beautifully. Even the white-lace girl paid her a languid little compliment. They had supper in the big, beautifully decorated dining room. Diana and Jane were invited to partake of this also, since they had come with Anne, but Billy was nowhere to be found, having decamped in mortal fear of some such invitation. He was in waiting for them, with the team, however, when it was all over, and the three girls came merrily out into the calm, white moonshine radiance. Anne breathed deeply, and looked into the clear sky beyond the dark boughs of the firs. Oh, it was good to be out again in the purity and silence of the night! How great and still and wonderful everything was, with the murmur of the sea sounding through it, and the darkling cliffs beyond like grim giants guarding enchanted coasts. "'Hasn't it been a perfectly splendid time?' sighed Jane as they drove away. "'I just wish I was a rich American and could spend my summer at a hotel and wear jewels and low-neck dresses and have ice cream and chicken salad every blessed day. I'm sure it would be ever so much more fun than teaching school. And your recitation was simply great, although I thought at first you were never going to begin.' I think it was better than Mrs. Evans. Oh, no, don't say things like that, Jane, said Anne quickly, because it sounds silly. It couldn't be better than Mrs. Evans's, you know, 
for she is a professional, and I'm only a schoolgirl with a little knack of reciting. I'm quite satisfied if the people just liked mine pretty well. I've a compliment for you, Anne, said Diana. At least I think it must be a compliment because of the tone he said it in. Part of it was, anyhow. There was an American sitting behind Jane and me, such a romantic-looking man, with coal-black hair and eyes. Josie Pye says he is a distinguished artist, and that her mother's cousin in Boston is married to a man that used to go to school with him. Well, we heard him say, didn't we, Jane, who is that girl on the platform with the splendid Titian hair? She has a face I should like to paint. There now, Anne. But what does Titian hair mean? Being interpreted, it means plain red, I guess, laughed Anne. Titian was a very famous artist who liked to paint red-haired women. Did you see all the diamonds those ladies wore? sighed Jane. They were simply dazzling. Wouldn't you just love to be rich, girls? We are rich, said Anne staunchly. Why, we have sixteen years to our credit, and we're as happy as queens, and we've all got imaginations, more or less. Look at that sea, girls, all silver and shadow and vision of things not seen. We couldn't enjoy its loveliness any more if we had millions of dollars and ropes of diamonds. You wouldn't change into any of those women if you could. Would you want to be that white-lace girl and wear a sour look all your life, as if you'd been born turning up your nose at the world? Or the pink lady, kind and nice as she is, so stout and short that you'd really no figure at all? Or even Mrs. Evans, with that sad, sad look in her eyes. She must have been dreadfully unhappy some time to have such a look. You know you wouldn't, Jane Andrews. I don't know, exactly, said Jane, unconvinced. I think diamonds would comfort a person for a good deal. Well, I don't want to be anyone but myself, even if I go uncomforted by diamonds all my life, declared Anne. I'm quite content to be Anne of Green Gables with my string of pearl beads. I know Matthew gave me as much love with them as ever went with Madame the Pink Lady's jewels. End of chapter 33《Chapter Thirty Four of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter Thirty Four A Queen's Girl. The next three weeks were busy ones at Green Gables, for Anne was getting ready to go to Queen's, and there was much sewing to be done and many things to be talked over and arranged. Anne's outfit was ample and pretty, for Matthew saw to that, and Marilla for once made no objections whatever to anything he purchased or suggested. More, one evening she went up to the east gable with her arms full of a delicate pale green material. "'Anne, here's something for a nice light dress for you. I don't suppose you really need it. You've plenty of pretty waists.' but I thought maybe you'd like something real dressy to wear if you were asked out anywhere of an evening in town, to a party or anything like that. I hear that Jane and Ruby and Josie have got evening dresses, as they call them, and I don't mean you shall be behind them. I got Mrs. Allen to help me pick it in town last week, and we'll get Emily Gillis to make it for you. Emily has got taste, and her fits aren't to be equaled. "'Oh, Marilla, it's just lovely,' said Anne. "'Thank you so much. I don't believe you ought to be so kind to me. It's making it harder every day for me to go away." The green dress was made up with as many tucks and frills and shirrings as Emily's taste permitted. Anne put it on one evening for Matthew's and Marilla's benefit, and recited the maiden's vow for them in the kitchen. As Marilla watched the bright, animated face and graceful motions, her thoughts went back to the evening Anne had arrived at Green Gables, and memory recalled a vivid picture of the odd, frightened child in her preposterous yellowish-brown wincy dress, the heartbreak looking out of her tearful eyes. Something in the memory brought tears to Marilla's own eyes. "'I declare, my recitation has made you cry, Marilla,' said Anne, gaily stooping over Marilla's chair to drop a butterfly kiss on that lady's cheek. "'Now I call that a positive triumph.' "'No, I wasn't crying over your piece,' said Marilla, 
who would have scorned to be betrayed into such weakness by any poetry stuff. I just couldn't help thinking of the little girl you used to be, Anne. And I was wishing you could have stayed a little girl, even with all your queer ways. You've grown up now, and you're going away, and you look so tall and stylish and so—so so different altogether in that dress, as if you didn't belong in Avonlea at all. And I just got lonesome thinking it all over. Marilla! Anne sat down on Marilla's gingham lap, took Marilla's lined face between her hands, and looked gravely and tenderly into Marilla's eyes. I'm not a bit changed. Not really. I'm only just pruned down and branched out. The real me back here is just the same. It won't make a bit of difference where I go or how much I change outwardly. At heart I shall always be your little Anne, who will love you and Matthew and dear Green Gables more and better every day of her life." Anne laid her fresh young cheek against Marilla's faded one and reached out a hand to pat Matthew's shoulder. Marilla would have given much just then to have possessed Anne's power of putting her feelings into words, but nature and habit had willed it otherwise, and she could only put her arms close about her girl and hold her tenderly to her heart, wishing that she need never let her go. Matthew, with a suspicious moisture in his eyes, got up and went out of doors. Under the stars of the blue summer night he walked agitatedly across the yard to the gate under the poplars. "'Well, now, I guess she ain't been much spoiled,' he muttered proudly. "'I guess my putting in my oar occasional never did much harm after all. She's smart and pretty and loving, too, which is better than all the rest. She's been a blessing to us, and there never was a luckier mistake than what Mrs. Spencer made, if it was luck. I don't believe it was any such thing. It was Providence, because the Almighty saw we needed her, I reckon. The day finally came when Anne must go to town. She and Matthew drove in one fine September morning, after a tearful parting with Diana, and an untearful practical one, on Marilla's side at least, with Marilla. But when Anne had gone Diana dried her tears and went to a beach picnic at White Sands with some of her Carmody cousins, where she contrived to enjoy herself tolerably well, while Marilla plunged fiercely into unnecessary work and kept at it all day long with the bitterest kind of heartache, the ache that burns and gnaws and cannot wash itself away in ready tears. But that night, when Marilla went to bed, acutely and miserably conscious that the little gable room at the end of the hall was untenanted by any vivid young life and unstirred by any soft breathing, she buried her face in her pillow and wept for her girl in a passion of sobs that appalled her when she grew calm enough to reflect how very wicked it must be to take on so about a sinful fellow-creature. Anne and the rest of the Avonlea scholars reached town just in time to hurry off to the academy. That first day passed pleasantly enough in a whirl of excitement, meeting all the new students, learning to know the professors by sight, and being assorted and organized into classes. Anne intended taking up the second-year work, being advised to do so by Miss Stacy. Gilbert Blythe elected to do the same. This meant getting a first-class teacher's license in one year instead of two if they were successful, but it also meant much more and harder work. Jane, Ruby, Josie, Charlie, and Moody Spurgeon, not being troubled with the stirrings of ambition, were content to take up the second-class work. Anne was conscious of a pang of loneliness when she found herself in a room with fifty other students, not one of whom she knew, except the tall, brown-haired boy across the room, and knowing him in the fashion she did did not help her much, as she reflected pessimistically. Yet she was undeniably glad that they were in the same class. The old rivalry could still be carried on, and Anne would hardly have known what to do if it had been lacking. "'I wouldn't feel comfortable without it,' she thought. Gilbert looks awfully determined. I suppose he's making up his mind here and now to win the medal. What a splendid chin he has! I never noticed it before. I do wish Jane and Ruby had gone in for first class, too. I suppose I won't feel so much like a cat in a strange garret when I get acquainted, though. I wonder which of the girls here are going to be my friends. It's really an interesting speculation. Of course, I promised Diana that no queen's girl, no matter how much I liked her, should ever be as dear to me as she is. But I've lots of second-best affections to bestow. I like the look of that girl with the brown eyes and the crimson waist. 
She looks vivid and red-rosy. There's that pale fair one gazing out of the window. She has lovely hair, and looks as if she knew a thing or two about dreams. I'd like to know them both, know them well, well enough to walk with my arm about their waists and call them nicknames. But just now I don't know them, and they don't know me, and probably don't want to know me particularly. Oh, it's lonesome! It was lonesomer still when Anne found herself alone in her hall bedroom that night at twilight. She was not to board with the other girls, who all had relatives in town to take pity on them. Miss Josephine Berry would have liked to board her, but Beechwood was so far from the academy that it was out of the question. So Miss Berry hunted up a boarding house, assuring Matthew and Marilla that it was the very place for Anne. The lady who keeps it is a reduced gentlewoman, explained Miss Berry. Her husband was a British officer, and she is very careful what sort of boarder she takes, and will not meet with any objectionable person under her roof. The table is good, and the house is near the academy, in a quiet neighborhood. All this might be quite true, and indeed proved to be so, but it did not materially help Anne in the first agony of homesickness that seized upon her. She looked dismally about her narrow little room, with its dull papered pictureless walls, its small iron bedstead and empty bookcase, and a horrible choke came into her throat as she thought of her own white room at Green Gables, where she would have the pleasant consciousness of a great green still outdoors, of sweet peas growing in the garden, and moonlight falling on the orchard, of the brook below the slope, and the spruce boughs tossing in the night wind beyond it, of a vast starry sky, and the light from Diana's windows shining out through the gap in the trees. Here there was nothing of this. Anne knew that outside of her window was a hard street, with a network of telephone wires shutting out the sky, the tramp of alien feet, and a thousand lights gleaming on stranger faces. She knew that she was going to cry, and fought against it. I won't cry. It's silly and weak. There's the third tear splashing down by my nose. There are more coming. I must think of something funny to stop them. But there's nothing funny except what is connected with Avonlea, and that only makes things worse. Four, five. I'm going home next Friday, but that seems a hundred years away. Oh, Matthew is nearly home by now, and Marilla is at the gate looking down the lane for him. Six, seven, eight. Oh, there's no use in counting them. They're coming in a flood presently. I can't cheer up. I don't want to cheer up. It's nicer to be miserable. The flood of tears would have come, no doubt, had not Josie Pye appeared at that moment. In the joy of seeing a familiar face, Anne forgot that there had never been much love lost between her and Josie. As a part of Avonlea life, even a Pye was welcome. "'I'm so glad you came up,' Anne said sincerely. "'You've been crying,' remarked Josie, with aggravating pity. "'I suppose you're homesick.' Some people have so little self-control in that respect. I've no intention of being homesick, I can tell you. Town's too jolly after that pokey old Avonlea. I wonder how I ever existed there so long. You shouldn't cry, Anne. It isn't becoming. For your nose and eyes get red, and then you seem all red. I had a perfectly scrumptious time in the academy today. Our French professor is simply a duck. His mustache would give you crawlops of the heart. <laughs> Have you anything eatable around, Anne? I'm literally starving. Ah, uh, I guessed likely Marilla'd load you up with cake. That's why I called around. Otherwise, I'd have gone to the park to hear the band play with Frank Stockley. He boards same place as I do, and he's a sport. He noticed you in class today and asked me who the red-headed girl was. I told him you were an orphan and that the Cuthsburgs had adopted, and nobody knew very much about what you'd been before that. Anne was wondering if, after all, solitude and tears were not more satisfactory than Josie Pye's companionship, when Jane and Ruby appeared, each with an inch of queen's color ribbon, purple and scarlet, pinned proudly to her coat. As Josie was not speaking to Jane just then, she had to subside into comparative harmlessness. Well, said Jane with a sigh, I feel as if I'd lived many moons since the morning. I ought to be home studying my Virgil. That horrid old professor gave us twenty lines to start in on tomorrow. But I simply couldn't settle down to study tonight. Anne, methinks I see the traces of tears. If you've been crying, do own up. 
It will restore my self-respect, for I was shedding tears freely before Ruby came along. I don't mind being a goose so much if somebody else is goosey, too. Cake, you'll give me a teeny piece, won't you? Thank you. It has the real Avonlea flavor. Ruby, perceiving the Queen's calendar lying on the table, wanted to know if Anne meant to try for the gold medal. Anne blushed and admitted she was thinking of it. Oh, that reminds me, said Josie. Queen's is to get one of the Avery scholarships after all. The word came today. Frank Stockley told me. His uncle is one of the Board of Governors, you know. It will be announced in the Academy tomorrow. An Avery scholarship! Anne felt her heart beat more quickly, and the horizons of her ambition shifted and broadened as if by magic. Before Josie had told the news, Anne's highest pinnacle of aspiration had been a teacher's provincial license, first class at the end of the year, and perhaps the medal. But now, in one moment, Anne saw herself winning the Avery Scholarship, taking an arts course at Redmond College, and graduating in a gown and mortarboard, before the echo of Josie's words had died away. For the Avery Scholarship was in English, and Anne felt that here her foot was on native heath. A wealthy manufacturer of New Brunswick had died, and left part of his fortune to endow a large number of scholarships to be distributed among the various high schools and academies of the maritime provinces, according to their respective standings. There had been much doubt whether one would be allotted to Queen's, but the matter was settled at last, and at the end of the year the graduate who made the highest mark in English and English literature would win the scholarship. Two hundred and fifty dollars a year for four years at Redmond College. No wonder that Anne went to bed that night with tingling cheeks. I'll win that scholarship if hard work can do it, she resolved. Wouldn't Matthew be proud if I got to be a B.A.? Oh, it's delightful to have ambitions. I'm so glad I have such a lot. And there never seems to be any end to them. That's the best of it. Just as soon as you attain to one ambition, you see another one glittering higher up still. It does make life so interesting. End of chapter 34Chapter 35 of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 35 The Winter at Queen's. Anne's homesickness wore off, greatly helped in the wearing by her weekend visits home. As long as the open weather lasted, the Avonlea students went out to Carmody on the New Branch Railway every Friday night. Diana and several other Avonlea young folks were generally on hand to meet them, and they all walked over to Avonlea in a merry party. Anne thought those Friday evening gypsyings over the autumnal hills in the crisp golden air, with the home lights of Avonlea twinkling beyond, were the best and dearest hours in the whole week. Gilbert Blythe nearly always walked with Ruby Gillis and carried her satchel for her. Ruby was a very handsome young lady, now thinking herself quite as grown up as she really was. She wore her skirts as long as her mother would let her, and did her hair up in town, though she had to take it down when she went home. She had large, bright blue eyes, a brilliant complexion, and a plump, showy figure. She laughed a great deal, was cheerful and good-tempered, and enjoyed the pleasant things of life, frankly. "'But I shouldn't think she was the sort of girl Gilbert would like,' whispered Jane to Anne. Anne did not think so either, but she would not have said so for the Avery scholarship. She could not help thinking, too, that it would be very pleasant to have such a friend as Gilbert to jest and chatter with and exchange ideas about books and studies and ambitions. Gilbert had ambitions, she knew, and Ruby Gillis did not seem the sort of person with whom such could be profitably discussed. There was no silly sentiment in Anne's ideas concerning Gilbert. Boys were to her, when she thought about them at all, merely possible good comrades. If she and Gilbert had been friends, she would not have cared how many other friends he had nor with whom he walked. She had a genius for friendship. Girl friends she had in plenty, but she had a vague consciousness that masculine friendship might also be a good thing to round out one's conceptions of companionship and furnish broader standpoints of judgment and comparison. 
Not that Anne could have put her feelings on the matter into just such clear definition. But she thought that if Gilbert had ever walked home with her from the train, over the crisp fields and along the ferny byways, they might have had many and merry and interesting conversations about the new world that was opening around them and their hopes and ambitions therein. Gilbert was a clever young fellow, with his own thoughts about things and a determination to get the best out of life and put the best into it. Ruby Gillis told Jane Andrews that she didn't understand half the things Gilbert Blythe said. He talked just like Anne Shirley did when she had a thoughtful fit on, and for her part she didn't think it any fun to be bothering about books and that sort of thing when you didn't have to. Frank Stockley had lots more dash and go, but then he wasn't half as good-looking as Gilbert, and she really couldn't decide which she liked best. In the academy Anne gradually drew a little circle of friends about her, thoughtful, imaginative, ambitious students like herself. With the rose-red girl, Stella Maynard, and the dream girl, Priscilla Grant, she soon became intimate, finding the latter pale, spiritual-looking maiden to be full to the brim of mischief and pranks and fun, while the vivid, black-eyed Stella had a heart full of wistful dreams and fancies, as aerial and rainbow-like as Anne's own. After the Christmas holidays, the Avonlea students gave up going home on Fridays and settled down to hard work. By this time all the Queen's scholars had gravitated into their own places in the ranks, and the various classes had assumed distinct and settled shadings of individuality. Certain facts had become generally accepted. It was admitted that the medal contestants had practically narrowed down to three, Gilbert Blythe, Anne Shirley, and Lewis Wilson. The Avery scholarship was more doubtful, any one of a certain six being a possible winner. The bronze medal for mathematics was considered as good as won by a fat, funny little up-country boy with a bumpy forehead and a patched coat. Ruby Gillis was the handsomest girl of the year at the academy. In the second-year classes Stella Maynard carried off the palm for beauty, with a small but critical minority in favor of Anne Shirley. Ethel Marr was admitted by all competent judges to have the most stylish modes of hairdressing, and Jane Andrews, plain, plodding, conscientious Jane, carried off the honors in the domestic science course. Even Josie Pye attained a certain preeminence as the sharpest-tongued young lady in attendance at Queen's. So it may be fairly stated that Miss Stacy's old pupils held their own in the wider arena of the academical course. Anne worked hard and steadily. Her rivalry with Gilbert was as intense as it had ever been in Avonlea School, although it was not known in the class at large, but somehow the bitterness had gone out of it. Anne no longer wished to win for the sake of defeating Gilbert, rather for the proud consciousness of a well-won victory over a worthy foeman. It would be worthwhile to win, but she no longer thought life would be insupportable if she did not. In spite of lessons, the students found opportunities for pleasant times. Anne spent many of her spare hours at Beechwood, and generally ate her Sunday dinners there and went to church with Miss Barry. The latter was, as she admitted, growing old, but her black eyes were not dim nor the vigor of her tongue in the least abated. But she never sharpened the latter on Anne, who continued to be a prime favorite with the critical old lady. "'That Anne girl improves all the time,' she said. I get tired of other girls. There is such a provoking and eternal sameness about them. Anne has as many shades as a rainbow, and every shade is the prettiest while it lasts. I don't know that she is as amusing as she was when she was a child, but she makes me love her, and I like people who make me love them. It saves me so much trouble in making myself love them. Then, almost before anybody realized it, spring had come. Out in Avonlea the Mayflowers were peeping pinkly out on the sear barrens where snow wreaths lingered, and the mist of green was on the woods and in the valleys. But in Charlottetown harassed Queen's students thought and talked only of examinations. "'It doesn't seem possible that the term is nearly over,' said Anne. "'Why, last fall it seemed so long to look forward to, a whole winter of studies and classes, and here we are with the exams looming up next week.' Girls, sometimes I feel as if those exams meant everything, but when I look at the big buds swelling on those chestnut trees and the misty blue air at the end of the streets, they don't seem half so important. Jane and Ruby and Josie, who had dropped in, did not take this view of it. 
To them the coming examinations were constantly very important indeed, far more important than chestnut buds or maytime hazes. It was all very well for Anne, who was sure of passing at least, to have her moments of belittling them, but when your whole future depended on them, as the girls truly thought theirs did, you could not regard them philosophically. I've lost seven pounds in the last two weeks, sighed Jane. It's no use to say don't worry. I will worry. Worrying helps you some. It seems as if you were doing something when you're worrying. It would be dreadful if I failed to get my license after going to Queen's all winter and spending so much money. I don't care, said Josie Pye. If I don't pass this year, I'm coming back next. My father can afford to send me. And Frank Stockley says that Professor Tremaine said Gilbert Blythe was sure to get the medal and that Emily Clay would likely win the Avery Scholarship. That may make me feel badly tomorrow, Josie, laughed Anne. But just now I honestly feel that as long as I know the violets are coming out all purple down in the hollow below Green Gables and that little ferns are poking their heads up in Lover's Lane, it's not a great deal of difference whether I win the Avery or not. I've done my best, and I begin to understand what is meant by the joy of the strife. Next to trying and winning, the best thing is trying and failing. Girls, don't talk about exams. Look at that arch of pale green sky over those houses, and picture to yourself what it must look like over the purply dark beech woods back of Avonlea. What are you going to wear for commencement, Jane? asked Ruby practically. Jane and Josie both answered at once and the chatter drifted into a side eddy of fashions. But Anne, with her elbows on the window sill, her soft cheek laid against her clasped hands, and her eyes filled with visions, looked out unheedingly across city roof and spire to that glorious dome of sunset sky, and wove her dreams of a possible future from the golden tissue of youth's own optimism. All the beyond was hers, with its possibilities lurking rosily in the oncoming years, each year a rose of promise to be woven into an immortal chaplet. End of chapter 35《Chapter 36 of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 36. The Glory and the Dream. On the morning when the final results of all the examinations were to be posted on the bulletin board at Queen's, Anne and Jane walked down the street together. Jane was smiling and happy. Examinations were over, and she was comfortably sure she had made a pass at least. Further considerations troubled Jane not at all. She had no soaring ambitions, and consequently was not affected with the unrest attendant thereon. For we pay a price for everything we get or take in this world, and although ambitions are well worth having, they are not to be cheaply won, but exact their dues of work and self-denial, anxiety and discouragement. Anne was pale and quiet. In ten more minutes she would know who had won the medal and who the Avery. Beyond those ten minutes there did not seem, just then, to be anything worth being called time. "'Of course you'll win one of them, anyhow,' said Jane, who couldn't understand how the faculty could be so unfair as to order it otherwise. "'I have no hope of the Avery,' said Anne. "'Everybody says Emily Clay will win it, and I'm not going to march up to that bulletin board and look at it before everybody. I haven't the moral courage. I'm going straight to the girls' dressing room.' You must read the announcements and then come and tell me, Jane, and I implore you in the name of our old friendship to do it as quickly as possible. If I have failed, just say so, without trying to break it gently, and whatever you do don't sympathize with me. Promise me this, Jane." Jane promised solemnly, but, as it happened, there was no necessity for such a promise. When they went up the entrance steps of Queen's, they found the hall full of boys who were carrying Gilbert Blythe around on their shoulders and yelling at the tops of their voices, Hurrah for Blythe, medalist! For a moment Anne felt one sickening pang of defeat and disappointment. So she had failed and Gilbert had won. Well, Matthew would be sorry. He had been so sure she would win. And then somebody called out, 
Three cheers for Miss Shirley, Shirley winner, winner of the Avery. Avery. Oh, Anne! Gasped Jane as they fled to the girls' dressing room amid hearty cheers. Oh, Anne, I'm so proud. Isn't it splendid? And then the girls were around them, and Anne was the center of a laughing, congratulating group. Her shoulders were thumped and her hands shaken vigorously. She was pushed and pulled and hugged, and among it all she managed to whisper to Jane, "'Oh, won't Matthew and Marilla be pleased? I must write the news home right away.'" Commencement was the next important happening. The exercises were held in the big assembly hall of the academy. Addresses were given, essays read, songs sung, the public award of diplomas, prizes, and medals made. Matthew and Marilla were there, with eyes and ears for only one student on the platform, a tall girl in pale green, with faintly flushed cheeks and starry eyes, who read the best essay, and was pointed out and whispered about as the Avery winner. "'Reckon you're glad we kept her, Marilla?' whispered Matthew, speaking for the first time since he had entered the hall, when Anne had finished her essay. "'It's not the first time I've been glad,' retorted Marilla. "'You do like to rub things in, Matthew Cuthbert.' Miss Barry, who was sitting behind them, leaned forward and poked Marilla in the back with her parasol. "'Aren't you proud of that, Anne girl? I am,' she said. Anne went home to Avonlea with Matthew and Marilla that evening. She had not been home since April, and she felt that she could not wait another day. The apple blossoms were out, and the world was fresh and young. Diana was at Green Gables to meet her. In her own white room, where Marilla had set a flowering house rose on the window sill, Anne looked about her and drew a long breath of happiness. Oh, Diana, it's so good to be back again. It's so good to see those pointed firs coming out against the pink sky, and that white orchard and the old Snow Queen. Isn't the breath of the mint delicious? And that tea rose, why, it's a song and a hope and a prayer all in one. And it's good to see you again, Diana. I thought you liked that Stella Maynard better than me," said Diana reproachfully. Josie Pye told me you did. Josie said you were infatuated with her. Anne laughed and pelted Diana with the faded June lilies of her bouquet. Stella Maynard is the dearest girl in the world except one, and you are that one, Diana," she said. I love you more than ever, and I've so many things to tell you. But just now I feel as if it were joy enough to sit here and look at you. I'm tired, I think. Tired of being studious and ambitious. I mean to spend at least two hours tomorrow lying out in the orchard grass, thinking of absolutely nothing. You've done splendidly, Anne. I suppose you won't be teaching now that you've won the Avery. No. I'm going to Redmond in September. Doesn't it seem wonderful? I'll have a brand new stock of ambition laid in by that time, after three glorious golden months of vacation. Jane and Ruby are going to teach. Isn't it splendid to think we all got through, even to Moody Spurgeon and Josie Pye?" "'The Newbridge trustees have offered Jane their school already,' said Diana. "'Gilbert Blythe is going to teach, too. He has to. His father can't afford to send him to college next year, after all, so he means to earn his own way through. I expect he'll get the school here if Miss Ames decides to leave." Anne felt a queer little sensation of dismayed surprise. She had not known this. She had expected that Gilbert would be going to Redmond also. What would she do without their inspiring rivalry? Would not work, even at a co-educational college with a real degree in prospect, be rather flat without her friend the enemy? The next morning at breakfast it suddenly struck Anne that Matthew was not looking well. Surely he was much grayer than he had been a year before. Marilla, she said hesitatingly when he had gone out, is Matthew quite well? No, he isn't, said Marilla in a troubled tone. He's had some real bad spells with his heart this spring, and he won't spare himself a mite. I've been real worried about him. But he's some better this while back, and we've got a good hired man, so I'm hoping he'll kind of rest and pick up. Maybe he will now you're home. You always cheer him up." Anne leaned across the table and took Marilla's face in her hands. "'You are not looking as well yourself as I'd like to see you, Marilla. You look tired. I'm afraid you've been working too hard. You must take a rest, now that I'm home. 
I'm just going to take this one day off to visit all the old dear spots and hunt up my old dreams, and then it will be your turn to be lazy while I do the work." Marilla smiled affectionately at her girl. "'It's not the work. It's my head. I've got a pain so often now behind my eyes. Dr. Spencer's been fussing with glasses, but they don't do me any good. There is a distinguished oculist coming to the island the last of June, and the doctor says I must see him. I guess I'll have to. I can't read or sew with any comfort now. Well, Anne, you've done real well at Queen's, I must say. To take first-class license in one year and win the Avery Scholarship. Well, well. Mrs. Lynde says pride goes before a fall, and she doesn't believe in the higher education of women at all. She says it unfits them for women's true sphere. I don't believe a word of it. Speaking of Rachel reminds me, did you hear anything about the Abbey Bank lately, Anne? I heard it was shaky," answered Anne. Why? That is what Rachel said. She was up here one day last week and said there was some talk about it. Matthew felt real worried. All we have saved is in that bank, every penny. I wanted Matthew to put it in the savings bank in the first place, but old Mr. Abbey was a great friend of father's and he'd always banked with him. Matthew said any bank with him at the head of it was good enough for anybody. I think he has only been its nominal head for many years," said Anne. He is a very old man. His nephews are really at the head of the institution." Well, when Rachel told us that, I wanted Matthew to draw our money right out, and he said he'd think of it. But Mr. Russell told him yesterday that the bank was all right. Anne had her good day in the companionship of the outdoor world. She never forgot that day. It was so bright and golden and fair, so free from shadow and so lavish of blossom. Anne spent some of its rich hours in the orchard. She went to the Dryad's Bubble and Willowmere and Violet Vale. She called at the manse and had a satisfying talk with Mrs. Allen. And finally, in the evening, she went with Matthew for the cows, through Lover's Lane to the back pasture. The woods were all gloried through with sunset, and the warm splendor of it streamed down through the hill gaps in the west. Matthew walked slowly with bent head. Anne, tall and erect, suited her springing step to his. You've been working too hard today, Matthew," she said reproachfully. Why won't you take things easier? Well, now, I can't seem to," said Matthew, as he opened the yard gate to let the cows through. It's only that I'm getting old, Anne, and keep forgetting it. Well, well, I've always worked pretty hard, and I'd rather drop in harness. If I had been the boy you sent for," said Anne wistfully, I'd be able to help you so much now and spare you in a hundred ways. I could find it in my heart to wish I had been, just for that." "'Well, now, I'd rather have you than a dozen boys, Anne,' said Matthew, patting her hand. "'Just mind you that, rather than a dozen boys. Well, now, I guess it wasn't a boy that took the Avery scholarship, was it? It was a girl. My girl. My girl that I'm proud of.' He smiled his shy smile at her as he went into the yard. Anne took the memory of it with her when she went to her room that night, and sat for a long while at her open window, thinking of the past and dreaming of the future. Outside the Snow Queen was mistily white in the moonshine. The frogs were singing in the marsh beyond Orchard Slope. Anne always remembered the silvery peaceful beauty and fragrant calm of that night. It was the last night before sorrow touched her life, and no life is ever quite the same again when once that cold, sanctifying touch has been laid upon it. End of chapter 36「Chapter 37 of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 37 The Reaper Whose Name is Death. Matthew! Matthew! What is the matter? Matthew! Are you sick? It was Marilla who spoke, alarm in every jerky word. Anne came through the hall, her hands full of white narcissus. It was long before Anne could love the sight or odor of white narcissus again. In time to hear her, and to see Matthew standing in the porch doorway, a folded paper in his hand, and his face strangely drawn and gray. 
Anne dropped her flowers and sprang across the kitchen to him at the same moment as Marilla. They were both too late. Before they could reach him, Matthew had fallen across the threshold. "'He's fainted!' gasped Marilla. "'Anne, run for Martin, quick, quick! He's at the barn!' Martin, the hired man, who had just driven home from the post office, started at once for the doctor, calling at Orchard Slope on his way to send Mr. and Mrs. Barry over. Mrs. Lynde, who was there on an errand, came too. They found Anne and Marilla distractedly trying to restore Matthew to consciousness. Mrs. Lynde pushed them gently aside, tried his pulse, and then laid her ear over his heart. She looked at their anxious faces sorrowfully, and the tears came into her eyes. "'Oh, Marilla,' she said gravely, "'I don't think we can do anything for him.' "'Mrs. Lynde, you don't think—you can't think Matthew is—is—' Anne could not say the dreadful word. She turned sick and pallid. "'Child, yes, I'm afraid of it. Look at his face. When you've seen that look as often as I have, you'll know what it means.' Anne looked at the still face and there beheld the seal of the great presence. When the doctor came, he said that death had been instantaneous and probably painless, caused in all likelihood by some sudden shock. The secret of the shock was discovered to be in the paper Matthew had held and which Martin had brought from the office that morning. It contained an account of the failure of the Abbey Bank. The news spread quickly through Avonlea, and all day friends and neighbors thronged Green Gables and came and went on errands of kindness for the dead and living. For the first time, shy, quiet Matthew Cuthbert was a person of central importance. The white majesty of death had fallen on him and set him apart as one crowned. When the calm night came softly down over Green Gables, the old house was hushed and tranquil. In the parlor lay Matthew Cuthbert in his coffin, his long gray hair framing his placid face, on which there was a little kindly smile as if he but slept, dreaming pleasant dreams. There were flowers about him, sweet old-fashioned flowers which his mother had planted in the homestead garden in her bridal days, and for which Matthew had always had a secret wordless love. Anne had gathered them and brought them to him, her anguished, tearless eyes burning in her white face. It was the last thing she could do for him. The Berries and Mrs. Lynde stayed with him that night. Diana, going to the east gable, where Anne was standing at her window, said gently, "'Anne, dear, would you like to have me sleep with you tonight?' "'Thank you, Diana.' Anne looked earnestly into her friend's face. "'I think you won't misunderstand me when I say I want to be alone. I'm not afraid. I haven't been alone one minute since it happened. And I want to be. I want to be quite silent and quiet and try to realize it. I can't realize it. Half the time it seems to me that Matthew can't be dead, and the other half it seems as if he must have been dead for a long time, and I've had this horrible dull ache ever since. Diana did not quite understand. Marilla's impassioned grief, breaking all the bounds of natural reserve and lifelong habit in its stormy rush, she could comprehend better than Anne's tearless agony. But she went away kindly, leaving Anne alone to keep her first vigil with sorrow. Anne hoped that the tears would come in solitude. It seemed to her a terrible thing that she could not shed a tear for Matthew, whom she had loved so much and who had been so kind to her, Matthew who had walked with her last evening at sunset and was now lying in the dim room below with that awful peace on his brow. But no tears came at first. Even when she knelt by her window in the darkness and prayed, looking up to the stars beyond the hills. No tears, only the same horrible dull ache of misery that kept on aching until she fell asleep, worn out with the day's pain and excitement. In the night she awakened, with the stillness and the darkness about her, and the recollection of the day came over her like a wave of sorrow. She could see Matthew's face smiling at her as he had smiled when they parted at the gate that last evening. She could hear his voice saying, my girl, my girl that I'm proud of. Then the tears came, and Anne wept her heart out. Marilla heard her and crept in to comfort her. There, there. Don't cry so, dearie. It can't bring him back. It... it isn't right to cry so. I knew that today, but I couldn't help it then. He'd always been such a good, kind brother to me. But God knows best. 
Oh, just let me cry, Marilla, sobbed Anne. The tears don't hurt me like that ache did. Stay here for a little while with me and keep your arm round me. So, I couldn't have Diana stay. She's good and kind and sweet. But it's not her sorrow. She's outside of it, and she couldn't come close enough to my heart to help me. It's our sorrow, yours and mine. Oh, Marilla, what will we do without him? We've got each other, Anne. I don't know what I'd do if you weren't here, if you'd never come. Oh, Anne, I know I've been kind of strict and harsh with you, maybe. But you mustn't think I didn't love you as well as Matthew did, for all that. I want to tell you now when I can. It's never been easy for me to say things out of my heart, but at times like this it's easier. I love you as dear as if you were my own flesh and blood, and you've been my joy and comfort ever since you came to Green Gables." Two days afterwards they carried Matthew Cuthbert over his homestead threshold, and away from the fields he had tilled, and the orchards he had loved, and the trees he had planted. And then Avonlea settled back to its usual placidity, and even at Green Gables affairs slipped into their old groove, and work was done, and duties fulfilled with regularity as before, although always with the aching sense of loss in all familiar things. Anne, new to grief, thought it almost sad that it could be so, that they could go on in the old way without Matthew. She felt something like shame and remorse when she discovered that the sunrises behind the firs and the pale pink buds opening in the garden gave her the old inrush of gladness when she saw them, that Diana's visits were pleasant to her, and that Diana's merry words and ways moved her to laughter and smiles, that, in brief, the beautiful world of blossom and love and friendship had lost none of its power to please her fancy and thrill her heart, that life still called to her with many insistent voices. It seems like disloyalty to Matthew somehow, to find pleasure in these things now that he has gone," she said wistfully to Mrs. Allen one evening, when they were together in the manse garden. I miss him so much, all the time. And yet, Mrs. Allen, the world and life seem very beautiful and interesting to me for all. Today Diana said something funny and I found myself laughing. I thought when it happened I could never laugh again and it somehow seems as if I oughtn't to. When Matthew was here, he liked to hear you laugh, and he liked to know that you found pleasure in the pleasant things around you," said Mrs. Allen gently. He is just away now, and he likes to know it just the same. I am sure we should not shut our hearts against the healing influences that nature offers us. But I can understand your feeling. I think we all experience the same thing. We resent the thought that anything can please us when someone we love is no longer here to share the pleasure with us, and we almost feel as if it were unfaithful to our sorrow when we find our interest in life returning to us. I was down to the graveyard to plant a rose bush on Matthew's grave this afternoon," said Anne dreamily. I took a slip of the little white Scotch rose bush his mother brought out from Scotland long ago. Matthew always liked those roses the best. They were so small and sweet on their thorny stems. It made me feel glad that I could plant it by his grave, as if I were doing something that must please him in taking it there to be near him. I hope he has roses like them in heaven. Perhaps the souls of all those little white roses that he has loved so many summers were all there to meet him. I must go home now. Marilla is all alone and she gets lonely at twilight. She will be lonelier still, I fear, when you go away again to college said Mrs. Allen. Anne did not reply. She said good night and went slowly back to Green Gables. Marilla was sitting on the front doorsteps and Anne sat down beside her. The door was open behind them, held back by a big pink conch shell with hints of sea sunsets in its smooth inner convolutions. Anne gathered some sprays of pale yellow honeysuckle and put them in her hair. She liked the delicious hint of fragrance as some aerial benediction above her every time she moved. Dr. Spencer was here while you were away, Marilla said. He says that the specialist will be in town tomorrow, and he insists that I must go in and have my eyes examined. I suppose I'd better go and have it over. I'll be more than thankful if the man can give me the right kind of glasses to suit my eyes. You won't mind staying here alone while I'm away, will you? Martin will have to drive me in, and there's ironing and baking to do. I shall be all right. 
Diana will come over for company for me. I shall attend to the ironing and baking beautifully. You needn't fear that I'll starch the handkerchiefs or flavor the cake with liniment." Marilla laughed. <laughs> what a girl you were for making mistakes in them days, Anne. You were always getting into scrapes. I did used to think you were possessed. Do you mind the time you dyed your hair? Yes, indeed. I shall never forget it," smiled Anne, touching the heavy braid of hair that was wound about her shapely head. I laugh a little now sometimes when I think what a worry my hair used to be to me. But I don't laugh much, because it was a very real trouble then. I did suffer terribly over my hair and my freckles. My freckles are really gone, and people are nice enough to tell me my hair is auburn now, all but Josie Pye. She informed me yesterday that she really thought it was redder than ever, or at least my black dress made it look redder, and she asked me if people who had red hair ever got used to having it. Marilla, I've almost decided to give up trying to like Josie Pye. I've made what I would once have called a heroic effort to like her, but Josie Pye won't be liked." "'Josie is a pie,' said Marilla sharply. "'So she can't help being disagreeable. I suppose people of that kind serve some useful purpose in society, but I must say I don't know what it is any more than I know the use of thistles. Is Josie going to teach?" "'No, she is going back to Queen's next year. So are Moody Spurgeon and Charlie Sloan. Jane and Ruby are going to teach and they have both got schools. Jane at Newbridge and Ruby at some place up west." "'Gilbert Blythe is going to teach, too, isn't he?' "'Yes. Briefly." "'What a nice-looking fellow he is,' said Marilla absently. "'I saw him in church last Sunday, and he seemed so tall and manly. He looks a lot like his father did at the same age. John Blythe was a nice boy. We used to be real good friends, he and I. People called him my beau." Anne looked up with swift interest. Oh, Marilla! And what happened? Why didn't you—' We had a quarrel. I wouldn't forgive him when he asked me to. I meant to, after a while. But I was sulky and angry, and I wanted to punish him first. He never came back. The Blythes were all mighty independent. But I always felt—rather sorry. I've always kind of wished I'd forgiven him when I had the chance." "'So you've had a bit of romance in your life, too,' said Anne softly. Yes, I suppose you might call it that. You wouldn't think so to look at me, would you? But you can never tell about people from their outsides. Everybody has forgot about me and John. I'd forgotten myself, but it all came back to me when I saw Gilbert last Sunday. End of chapter 37「Chapter thirty eight of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter thirty eight. The Bend in the Road. Marilla went to town the next day and returned in the evening. Anne had gone over to Orchard Slope with Diana and came back to find Marilla in the kitchen, sitting by the table with her head leaning on her hand. Something in her dejected attitude struck a chill to Anne's heart. She had never seen Marilla sit limply inert like that. "'Are you very tired, Marilla?' "'Yes. No. I don't know,' said Marilla wearily, looking up. "'I suppose I am tired, but I haven't thought about it. It's not that.' "'Did you see the oculist?' What did he say?" asked Anne anxiously. Yes, I saw him. He examined my eyes. He says that if I give up all reading and sewing entirely, and any kind of work that strains the eyes, and if I'm careful not to cry, and if I wear the glasses he's given me, he thinks my eyes may not get any worse, and my headaches will be cured. But if I don't, he says I'll certainly be stone blind in six months. Blind! Anne, just think of it!" For a minute Anne, after her first quick exclamation of dismay, was silent. It seemed to her that she could not speak. Then she said bravely, but with a catch in her voice, "'Marilla, don't think of it. You know he has given you hope. If you are careful you won't lose your sight altogether, and if his glasses cure your headaches it will be a great thing.' "'I don't call it much hope.' 
said Marilla bitterly. What am I to live for if I can't read or sew or do anything like that? I might as well be blind. Or dead. And as for crying, I can't help that when I get lonesome. But there, it's no good talking about it. If you'll get me a cup of tea, I'll be thankful. I'm about done out. Don't say anything about this to anyone for a spell yet, anyway. I can't bear that folks should come here to question and sympathize and talk about it." When Marilla had eaten her lunch, Anne persuaded her to go to bed. Then Anne went herself to the east gable and sat down by her window in the darkness alone with her tears and her heaviness of heart. How sadly things had changed since she had sat there the night after coming home. Then she had been full of hope and joy, and the future had looked rosy with promise. Anne felt as if she had lived years since then, but before she went to bed there was a smile on her lips and peace in her heart. She had looked her duty courageously in the face and found it a friend, as duty ever is when we meet it frankly. One afternoon a few days later, Marilla came slowly in from the front yard where she had been talking to a caller, a man whom Anne knew by sight as Sadler from Carmody. Anne wondered what he could have been saying to bring that look to Marilla's face. What did Mr. Sadler want, Marilla? Marilla sat down by the window and looked at Anne. There were tears in her eyes in defiance of the oculist's prohibition, and her voice broke as she said, he heard that I was going to sell Green Gables, and he wants to buy it. Buy it? Buy Green Gables? Anne wondered if she had heard aright. Oh, Marilla, you don't mean to sell Green Gables? Anne, I don't know what else is to be done. I've thought it all over. If my eyes were strong I could stay here and make out to look after things and manage with a good hired man. But as it is, I can't. I may lose my sight altogether and anyway I'll not be fit to run things. Oh, I never thought I'd live to see the day when I'd have to sell my home. But things would only go behind worse and worse all the time, till nobody would want to buy it. Every cent of our money went in that bank, and there's some notes Matthew gave last fall to pay. Mrs. Lynde advises me to sell the farm and board somewhere. With her, I suppose. It won't bring much. It's small and the buildings are old but it'll be enough for me to live on, I reckon. I'm thankful you're provided for with that scholarship, Anne. I'm sorry you won't have a home to come to in your vacations, that's all. But I suppose you'll manage somehow." Marilla broke down and wept bitterly. "'You mustn't sell Green Gables,' said Anne resolutely. "'Oh, Anne, I wish I didn't have to. But you can see for yourself I can't stay here alone. I'd go crazy with trouble and loneliness. And my sight would go, I know it would. You won't have to stay here alone, Marilla. I'll be with you. I'm not going to Redmond. Not going to Redmond? Marilla lifted her worn face from her hands and looked at Anne. Why, what do you mean? Just what I say. I'm not going to take the scholarship. I decided so the night after you came home from town. You surely don't think I could leave you alone in your trouble, Marilla, after all you've done for me. I've been thinking and planning. Let me tell you my plans. Mr. Barry wants to rent the farm for next year, so you won't have any bother over that. And I'm going to teach. I've applied for the school here, but I don't expect to get it, for I understand the trustees have promised it to Gilbert Blythe. But I can have the Carmody School. Mr. Blair told me so last night at the store. Of course that won't be quite as nice or convenient as if I had the Avonlea School. But I can board home and drive myself over to Carmody and back, in the warm weather at least and even in winter I can come home Fridays. We'll keep a horse for that. Oh, I have it all planned out, Marilla, and I'll read to you and keep you cheered up. You shan't be dull or lonesome, and we'll be real cozy and happy here together, you and I." Marilla had listened like a woman in a dream. Oh, Anne, I could get on real well if you were here, I know. But I can't let you sacrifice yourself so for me. It would be terrible. Nonsense! Anne laughed merrily. There is no sacrifice. Nothing could be worse than giving up Green Gables. Nothing could hurt me more. We must keep the dear old place. My mind is quite made up, Marilla. I'm not going to Redmond, and I am going to stay here and teach. Don't you worry about me a bit." But your ambitions, and— I'm just as ambitious as ever. Only I've changed the object of my ambitions. I'm going to be a good teacher, and I'm going to save your eyesight. Besides, I mean to study at home here and take a little college course all by myself. 
Oh, I've dozens of plans, Marilla. I've been thinking them out for a week. I shall give life here my best, and I believe it will give its best to me in return. When I left Queen's, my future seemed to stretch out before me like a straight road. I thought I could see along it for many a milestone. Now there is a bend in it. I don't know what lies around the bend, but I'm going to believe that the best does. It has a fascination of its own, that bend, Marilla. I wonder how the road beyond it goes. What there is of green glory and soft checkered light and shadows. What new landscapes. What new beauties. What curves and hills and valleys further on. I don't feel as if I ought to let you give it up," said Marilla, referring to the scholarship. But you can't prevent me. I'm sixteen and a half, obstinate as a mule, as Mrs. Lynde once told me," laughed Anne. Oh, Marilla, don't you go pitying me. I don't like to be pitied, and there is no need for it. I'm heart-glad over the very thought of staying at dear Green Gables. Nobody could love it as you and I do, so we must keep it. You. "'Blessed girl,' said Marilla, yielding. "'I feel as if you'd given me new life. I guess I ought to stick out and make you go to college. But I know I can't, so I ain't going to try. I'll make it up to you, though, Anne.' When it became noised abroad in Avonlea that Anne Shirley had given up the idea of going to college and intended to stay home and teach, there was a good deal of discussion over it. Most of the good folks, not knowing about Marilla's eyes, thought she was foolish. Mrs. Allen did not. She told Anne so in approving words that brought tears of pleasure to the girl's eyes. Neither did good Mrs. Lynde. She came up one evening and found Anne and Marilla sitting at the front door in the warm, scented summer dusk. They liked to sit there when the twilight came down and the white moths flew about in the garden and the odor of mint filled the dewy air. Mrs. Rachel deposited her substantial person upon the stone bench by the door behind which grew a row of tall pink and yellow hollyhocks, with a long breath of mingled weariness and relief. "'I declare I'm getting glad to sit down. I've been on my feet all day, and two hundred pounds is a good bit for two feet to carry around. It's a great blessing not to be fat, Marilla. I hope you appreciate it. Well, Anne, I hear you've given up your notion of going to college. I was real glad to hear it. You've got as much education now as a woman can be comfortable with.' I don't believe in girls going to college with the men and cramming their heads full of Latin and Greek and all that nonsense. But I'm going to study Latin and Greek just the same, Mrs. Lynde, said Anne, laughing. I'm going to take my arts course right here at Green Gables and study everything that I would at college. Mrs. Lynde lifted her hands in holy horror. And surely you'll kill yourself. Not a bit of it. I shall thrive on it. Oh, I'm not going to overdo things. As Josiah Allen's wife says, I shall be medium. But I'll have lots of spare time in the long winter evenings, and I've no vocation for fancy work. I'm going to teach over at Carmody, you know. I don't know it. I guess you're going to teach right here in Avonlea. The trustees have decided to give you the school. Mrs. Lynde, cried Anne, springing to her feet in surprise. Why, I thought they had promised it to Gilbert Blythe. So they did. But as soon as Gilbert heard that you had applied for it, he went to them. They had a business meeting at the school last night, you know, and told them that he withdrew his application and suggested that they accept yours. He said he was going to teach at White Sands. Of course, he knew how much he wanted to stay with Marilla. And I must say, I think it was real kind and thoughtful in him, that's what. Real self-sacrificing, too. For he'll have his board to pay at White Sands, and everybody knows he's got to earn his own way through college. So the trustees decided to take you. I was tickled to death when Thomas came home and told me. I don't feel that I ought to take it, murmured Anne. I mean, I don't think I ought to let Gilbert make such a sacrifice for... for me. I guess you can't prevent him now. He signed papers with the White Sands trustees. So it wouldn't do him any good now if you were to refuse. Of course you'll take the school. You'll get along all right now that there are no pies going. Josie was the last of them, and a good thing she was, that's what. There's been some pie or other going to Avonlea School for the last twenty years, and I guess their mission in life was to keep school teachers reminded that Earth isn't their home. Bless my heart, what does all that winking and blinking at the Barry Gable mean? Diana is signaling for me to go over, laughed Anne. You know we keep up the old custom. Excuse me while I run over and see what she wants. Anne ran down the clover slope like a deer and disappeared in the furry shadows of the haunted wood. 
Mrs. Lynde looked after her indulgently. There's a good deal of the child about her yet in some ways. There's a good deal more of the woman about her in others, retorted Marilla, with a momentary return of her old crispness. But crispness was no longer Marilla's distinguishing characteristic. As Mrs. Lynde told her Thomas that night, Marilla Cuthbert has got mellow, that's what. Anne went to the little Avonlea graveyard the next evening to put fresh flowers on Matthew's grave and water the Scotch rosebush. She lingered there until dusk, liking the peace and calm of the little place, with its poplars whose rustle was like low, friendly speech, and its whispering grasses growing at will among the graves. When she finally left it and walked down the long hill that sloped to the Lake of Shining Waters, it was past sunset, and all Avonlea lay before her in a dreamlike afterlight, a haunt of ancient peace. There was a freshness in the air, as of a wind that had blown over honey-sweet fields of clover. Home lights twinkled out here and there among the homestead trees. Beyond lay the sea, misty and purple, with its haunting, unceasing murmur. The west was a glory of soft mingled hues, and the pond reflected them all in still softer shadings. The beauty of it all thrilled Anne's heart, and she gratefully opened the gates of her soul to it. "'Dear old world,' she murmured, "'you are very lovely, and I am glad to be alive in you.' Halfway down the hill, a tall lad came whistling out of a gate before the Blythe homestead. It was Gilbert, and the whistle died on his lips as he recognized Anne. He lifted his cap courteously, but he would have passed on in silence if Anne had not stopped and held out her hand. "'Gilbert,' she said, with scarlet cheeks, "'I want to thank you for giving up the school for me. It was very good of you, and I want you to know that I appreciate it.' Gilbert took the offered hand eagerly. "'It wasn't particularly good of me at all, Anne. I was pleased to be able to do you some small service. Are we going to be friends after this? Have you really forgiven me my old fault?' Anne laughed and tried unsuccessfully to withdraw her hand. "'I forgave you that day by the pond landing, although I didn't know it. What a stubborn little goose I was. I've been—I may as well make a complete confession—I've been sorry ever since.' "'We're going to be the best of friends,' said Gilbert, jubilantly. "'We were born to be good friends, Anne. You've thwarted destiny enough. I know we can help each other in many ways.' You're going to keep up your studies, aren't you? So am I. Come, I'm going to walk home with you." Marilla looked curiously at Anne when the latter entered the kitchen. "'Who was that came up the lane with you, Anne?' "'Gilbert Blythe,' answered Anne, vexed to find herself blushing. "'I met him on Barry's Hill.' "'I didn't think you and Gilbert Blythe were such good friends that you'd stand for half an hour at the gate talking to him,' said Marilla with a dry smile. "'We haven't been.' We've been good enemies, but we have decided that it will be much more sensible to be good friends in the future. Were we really there half an hour? It seemed just a few minutes. But you see, we have five years' lost conversations to catch up with, Marilla." Anne sat long at her window that night, companioned by a glad content. The wind purred softly in the cherry boughs, and the mint breaths came up to her. The stars twinkled over the pointed firs in the hollow and Diana's light gleamed through the old gap. Anne's horizons had closed in since the night she had sat there after coming home from Queen's, but if the path set before her feet was to be narrow, she knew that flowers of quiet happiness would bloom along it. The joy of sincere work and worthy aspiration and congenial friendship were to be hers. Nothing could rob her of her birthright of fancy or her ideal world of dreams. And there was always the bend in the road. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world," whispered Anne softly. End of chapter 38 End of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery